All right, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm Peter and I'll be talking about what I think is um, a somewhat common um, pain point within operations teams and I guess that's about how we get things done or planning, I guess. So just to give you um, a quick overview of who I am and sort of why I've got the context of um, my thoughts around this. Um, I'm currently uh, one of the operations leads at REA. Um, similar to what Tammy was mentioning at um, Dropbox, we've got multiple um, sort of ops teams that look after different areas of the business. So in my particular case, um, I have a team of uh, three individuals um, plus a grad. So there's myself and my team at Stand Up there. Um, we look after three development teams, uh, each with uh, about so six six devs plus QA plus BA, you know, sort of the cross-functional agile teams that you find a lot of similar type businesses. Um, and we look after currently about uh, uh, 10 to 15 different applications or systems, um, all in various different life cycles. So everything from the fact that uh, there is a project inception going on at the moment while my team is here, but um, through right through to stuff that is in production and hasn't really been worked on for a couple of years. So uh, on top of that, I've been a sysadmin for my entire career, um, and I have worked in a number of teams where I guess planning and getting things done while keeping the lights on and all the other things we have to do in operations is a, a common problem. So what is the actual problem? Like, why is this so hard? I mean, uh, software development teams don't seem to struggle with this as much as operations do. I mean, yes, there are challenges there as well, but it seems to be that operations is you know, somewhat of a special case. So this is kind of my thoughts around this. Um, first, ops is not a project. Uh, there is no fixed scope or timeline for what we do. Our job is to keep things running and to get new things into production. And, but we participate in many projects. In fact, we're in the critical path for a lot of those projects, you know, especially when it comes to building new infrastructure or getting the next version out. We also have many sources of our work. It's not just from the development teams. It's also from security. Uh, you know, if um, a new exploit comes out for OpenSSH or OpenSSL, you know, you have to almost drop everything and work on it. It's not something you can kind of deprioritize and go, oh, look, I can't do that this week. Um, and then, of course, you've also got incidents when things break. And then on top of that, you actually want to try and improve the infrastructure you're working on, which might not be part of a project or might not be seen as, as great a value to a development stream. But in ops, you know it's quite important. So I guess the first step to this to try and understand the work. Because um, obviously we can't do anything if we don't actually understand what we're working on at a given time. So first thing I'd say here is make sure you're documenting what you're doing. Um, this can take a number of forms depending on what tools you're familiar with and the type of environment you work in. Uh, at REA we generally use um, card walls, um, whether that's digital or physical, but uh, ticketing systems would work just as well. It's mainly the idea that you understand on a daily basis what work is coming into the team and what you're working on. It doesn't have to be a great detail, but it's just enough so that you can understand where the, where the demand is coming from and how much time is spent on a given piece of work. And then on top of that, it's really important to talk about the work as well. Um, again, it's to raise that visibility with inside the team and also externally. So one of the things I almost consider mandatory in an operations team is a 15-minute meeting in the mornings, um, stand-up meeting. So just to cover that, what are we doing today? Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of visibility about what you're actually working on. Then after this, you want to move into, OK, well, we need to start planning what we're going to be working on. Um, but it's a case of we can only plan a certain amount. And you also need to prepare for the unplanned. So the way um, I like to tackle this is similar to um, an agile software team, uh, generally work in fixed iterations. So it kind of works nicely if uh, your team, um, particularly if you're working in an, um, somewhere where software development is done in an agile way, it kind of works nicely if you're following a similar kind of pattern in terms of iterations. 
But that said, it doesn't have to be if your customers are not, you know, whether that's developers or some other part of the business, are not working in iterations. It doesn't mean you can't. The basic idea is that uh, you scope out the work you want to achieve in the next X weeks. Uh, in our case, we've chosen two weeks, mainly because it fits in with the business, but you, know, you could go one week or a month, but I certainly wouldn't want to go any further than a month, and I think two weeks is a nice figure. But then also, you must leave slack in this. Um, so I've got, I've got a graph here which um, is sort of inspired from the book The Phoenix Project, if any of uh, you have seen that. Um, and it's basically looking at um, how wait time happens, what happens to wait time when your utilisation gets too high. So sort of once you get above 80%, your wait time goes through the roof. Um, and that sort of becomes very true with your iterations. If you uh, plan to be 100% utilised, um, it's not going to work out well for you because there are going to be those other sources of work that come in, whether it's from security or from you know, incidents, that kind of thing. So I guess the key message there is make sure you're realistic when you're doing your planning. But then, of course, there's interruptions. And as I'm sure every sysadmin in here will know about the joy of interruptions and context switching. So um, here's sort of some of the uh, methods I found that work for dealing with interruptions. Um, so with, within REA, again, we've got a number of different ops teams. So I sort of spoke to the different ops teams and sort of said, well, what do you guys do as well as knowing what I do as well? Uh, and there's a couple of different kind of tactics you can use here. One of them is to um, assign team members to your customer. So whether that's if you're servicing multiple development teams, you might have um, one ops person who is kind of the first point of contact for a given development team. Uh, or, you know, if it happens to be, so one of our cases where this works is our central our kind of infrastructure core team. So they kind of assign one team member to each one of the other ops teams as a first point of contact. Uh, in our case, we've uh, tried a different method. We have what's called an ops goalkeeper. So an ops goalkeeper is a rotating role that um, uh, a, a person takes on for a given week and they basically become the interruptions person for that week. So they, they take on any tasks that come into the team that are unplanned, I guess. So they will generally look after day pager for the, the ops team pager. Uh, they will also um, be the person that the, development lead, the delivery leads in the development teams will know to go and chat to first. Um, so the goalkeeper sort of, you know, obviously comes from the soccer analogy that they're the ones trying to stop the ball going through to the rest of the team. So the rest of the team can then focus on uh, delivering on the planned work rather than the unplanned work, hopefully. And the third one is obviously, if you can do it, get developers on pager. So this is really around closing the food feedback loop. So if your developers have to support the applications that they write, um, they are aware of the issues in production. Um, they can see, get, get a greater understanding of how production works. Um, and hopefully, as a result, you will have uh, less, uh, less alerts coming through to your team. Um, and on top of that, it's... Um, no, sorry, I lost my thought there. Um, yeah, anyway, it's, it's mainly just around closing that feedback loop. So. So once you're in this situation, then you need to start making sure you're reviewing your processes often because you know, the processes are only, again, it's an, again coming back to a feedback loop, but inside the team and how you look after um, those processes and make sure they're still working for you. So we run a uh, retrospective meeting at the end of each iteration. Uh, this is a very simple meeting to basically look back at um, how the iteration went um, and to basically go over, you know, what went well, what didn't, uh, what questions do we have, that kind of thing, so that we can then feed back into the process and go, you know, oh, we're finding that we're, you know, pulling in too many cards for iteration and we're going over all that kind of thing. So, on top of that, um, reporting is really valuable. I know we don't like doing it, but um, it does give us a lot of good insights into the type of work we're doing and trends and so forth. So I've got a graph there, which um, it's actually a real graph from my reporting showing our card breakdown and the different projects that we're working on. Um, I've obviously removed uh, project names to protect the guilty, but um, you can see that our trend there has suddenly changed in the last um, iteration I have up there. 
And that's because we had a new project kickoff, which required a lot of work from my team. Uh, so rather than focusing on any of the other projects, we were pretty much working on our own stuff and their project, uh, which was really good when I was able to go into a conversation with one of the delivery leads who was asking why things were taking a while, and I was able to show them the data and say, this is exactly why it's happening, These are the this is what we're working on for you, and he was able to get a much better picture and felt confident that we knew what we were doing and we were trying to get things done and get out of his critical path as quickly as possible. And on top of that, um, dashboards. So um, again, it's been mentioned, I think it was in um, Joe's talk um, on the P-Interest stuff about the number of metrics they gather and so forth. It's really good to extend those metrics into the, um, the team type metrics as well. So look at how you're tracking in the iteration. Um, look at other types of work that are coming into the team or um, the sources of work and how they're tracking as well. So once you get to this point, hopefully you've got your sort of day-to-day -day and, you know, a couple of weeks under control and you're able to start getting through that type of work. It's then about having a longer-term picture, understanding where you're actually heading as a team. So this is around having um, probably longer-term goals for your team. Uh, you know, actually write these down somewhere um, and have a sort of common view of what do you want to achieve in the next six months, 12 months, that kind of thing. So, you know, these can be quite broad and, um, you know, statements like no pets in production um, or, yeah, the fact that you actually want documentation for all your applications. There's also a good time to think about um, failure demand versus value demand. For those that aren't familiar with that term, it's um, pretty much what Tammy was talking about in terms of um, making sure that the work you're doing um, is adding value rather than just fixing problems. So if you have a lot of break-fix type work coming into, that's generally failure demand, whereas you're actually improving infrastructure, uh, deploying your applications in a better way, then that's obviously value. So it's really good to track that kind of difference. And then sort of a question I always ask my team, they probably get annoyed at me asking this question, but, you know, is our day-to-day -day work moving us towards our goals and, you know, um, or are we just kind of spinning our wheels? So it's a good thing to sort of, you know, have that self-check of any sort of piece of work that you're doing and sort of ask yourself, well, how does this relate to where we want to be? And if you do all that, profit, hopefully. And that's about it. So, questions? Yep. Um, I think it's significant that idea that you, know, you don't just fix the problems, you actually add value and try to make sure that the problem never resurfaces. Uh, that's you know, often applicable to um, development where you know, a better programming technique or uh, you know, not just putting a band aid on it, fixing the bug once and for all is a good thing. Is, this, is that something you think is also? So, so the question was um, the uh, the adding value to or around work, whether that applies to operations as much as the development work. Um, I, I think it does. Um, I don't think the the work matters. In fact, I'd go as far to say it's almost any part of the business, whether technical or non-technical, because um, it's really just about that that view of going well. Is the work I'm doing right now, you know, is uh, you know, fixing this server, is this actually adding value? You know, like, is this a problem that I'm removing or am I just fixing, fixing the symptoms and this can break again tomorrow? Um, and look, sometimes you have to do the, the break-fix works. And, you know, it's not like you can always go, oh, well, you know, I don't want to fix this right now because it's not going to add value long-term. That's not always an option, but at least you need to capture that, understand it, and then if you start to see that you're spending most of your time doing failure demand, you need to work out a plan to counteract that, I guess. And that really comes into how you plan your iterations and, or plan your work. Yeah. Yep. So the question was whether getting devs on the pages has improved, improved the code. Um, yes, I would, I'd say for the most part. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's as much an educational piece for the developers understanding the infrastructure that their code is running on more than anything else. 
Um, you know, I, I don't think it's just because uh, you know developers you know, are suddenly more proactive. It's more just a, an education piece, and they understand how their code runs now. So, yeah. At the back there. So the question was around the ops goalkeeper and how to make the process smoother if you feel you have a uh, staff member that would have to then go and ask someone else anyway. Um, I think the answer is I'm, uh, I'm okay with that happening. Um, so that's, that's not an uncommon occurrence in my team that the goalkeeper will have to effectively you know, escalate to someone else in the team, whether it's myself or one of the other staff members. Um, I think that's good because that promotes knowledge sharing and that's actually why one of the things I was keen to try it. Um, but it's, it's a case of experiment, you know, try it in your team, you know, try it for a couple, you know, a month or something like that, have your retrospective meeting and see how the team feel about it. You know, if they like it, keep doing it, if they don't like it, do something else. The other yeah. thing is it works as a triage, so if it's not actually critically urgent that it has to be answered right now, they can leave it till lunchtime or leave it till they're taking a break from whatever they're deep in. Uh, yeah, so that, that was the thing about it. it's a triage point. Um, and that is very true. So the, um, hopefully, even if the ops goalkeeper might not be able to solve the issue, they hopefully might have enough information or enough understanding to go, is this something I need to drop everything for and harass the rest of the team? Or is this something that we can um, yeah, leave until after lunch or until the person's free? So yes, very true. And sometimes also, if, um, if it's a larger piece of work, um, but a non-urgent piece of work, then also be a case of, well, let's card that up and put it in our backlog for our next iteration. So we don't necessarily even have to do it this week, but it's having that person to understand that, yep. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>